Power 5036, that says basically this, that if your state used paperless voting in 2006, and if it buys better technology for use in 2008, then the federal government will help pay for it. This doesn't require states to do anything, but it offers them an incentive to move in the direction that, um, that Representative Holt and, uh, and many other people um, would like them to. So this is the light version of the Holt bill. It was recently introduced. Maybe it will pass. Maybe it will take effect for the 2008 election. Um, but don't bet the House on it. All right. So um, we have movement maybe at the federal level, maybe slow, maybe not at all, uh, toward requiring, um, toward requiring a, 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 an election system that uh, keeps and uses paper records. We also have significant progress in the states and probably more progress being made in the states. Uh, so let's now look forward and ask ourselves, uh, when we get to a place where we have paper and electronic records, what should we do? We have this idea that we need to, um, that we need to uh, use the redundancy of these records. Um, well, first of all, the first thing to note, so how should we do this? The first thing to note is redundancy only helps if we actually use both records. If we just take the paper records and put them in a warehouse and never look at them, then they don't do us any good from a security point of view. Um, so, but, but the challenge here is that the electronic records are fast and cheap to tally. They're the things that you would like to tally for cost and, and speed and efficiency reasons. But the paper records are very expensive, and paper records, unfortunately, are very expensive and slow to tally. But the paper record is what the voter saw. Uh, and if you want that link to something that the voter actually saw, then you need to incorporate the paper record into the system. So what are we going to do about this? How should we use these paper records that, on the one hand, are slow and expensive and inconvenient to handle, but on the other hand, are the only thing that we can link to the voter's intent? Well, one thing we could do is use a machine to count the paper records. So we're going to take all these paper records, we're going to throw them into some big sheet-fed scanner, we're going to scan them through, have some software that, that reads them and does optical character recognition or whatever, and counts the votes. That's unfortunately risky. The whole reason we have this paper record is we didn't want to trust some machine running software that's hard to examine um, in, in, in counting the votes. Um, switching to a different machine is not really the, the thing we're looking for. We could count all of the paper records by hand. That would uh, have a lot of advantages, but it's really expensive. Very expensive, very slow, and not really practical. So the only thing that is left, and the thing that we're going to have to do, is to check some random subset of the paper records by hand. But how are we going to choose this subset? How are we going to do it? Um, that um, turns out to be a pretty interesting technical research problem. The standard approach to doing this, um, which I'll illustrate here in the state of Sideways, Illinois, is to, um, is, is to uh, take the, the, um, the area, it's divided up into precincts. We're going to pick some precincts at random. Um, we're going to hand count the paper records in those precincts. And in each precinct that we picked, we're going to compare the result of our hand count against the electronic count. And we're going to say they'd better match. If they don't match, that's evidence that something is wrong. OK. Let's get more precise about what we're trying to do. Our goal, to be a little bit more precise, is to establish with high statistical confidence that if we hand counted all of the paper ballots in the whole state, that this would yield the same, that, the, that, that count would yield the same winner as the electronic tally. We don't care so much whether the, that that candidate should have won by 5% or 10% or 15%. What we care about is that uh, we got the winner right in the election. So we want to verify that. Um, let's get a little bit more specific in an example. Here we have a, a hypothetical election, and the post-election tally, the electronic tally, says that Alice got 55% of the votes and Bob got 45% of the votes. Right. In, the, uh, in this scenario, what we, want to, what we want to do is reject the hypothesis, by statistical evidence, reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of the ballots differ between the electronic and paper counts. If more than 5% of the ballots differ, then it might be that if, if say, 6% differ, then it might be that Bob has 51% of the paper ballots and Alice has 49, uh, and that's what we want to avoid. But if we can reject the hypothesis that 5% or more are different, then we know that, the, that a full paper count would establish that Alice was the real winner. Okay. Yes. The, uh, yes. So there are systems where you like put the paper records in different stacks and you weigh them, you separate them. Um, 
Well, in order for the first step in doing that was uh, so. Let me repeat the question, right? So the question is, um, is that in some places they use a system where you divide the ballots into two piles based on what who they're cast for, and you just weigh the piles, uh, and you see, um, and you know, Alice's Alice's pile should weigh what is it, twenty percent more than Bob's pile, roughly. You know what you know the proportions of the what the weights should be. Uh, one of the difficulties of doing this, though, is you have to reliably separate the ballots into two piles in the first place in order to do this. Um, and in order to separate them into piles, you can use a machine. That's a, that's a solution we want to avoid. Or you can do it by hand. So th that's essentially a way of doing a hand count, which is what we're trying to avoid. Huh. Gee. Not, not to be overly pedantic, but wouldn't it be the case that if every ballot was marked with one of those two choices and there were no blank ballots, yes. If there was a difference of two and a half percent of the ballots, that would swing the election. In this case, n no, because you might bring Bob up to forty-seven and a half, and you might bring but Alice down to fifty-two. It would reduce and Alice by two and a half and bring Bob up by two and a half. Right. So that brings you still. Oh, you've got a ten difference. It's a ten percent okay. right difference. Ten difference. So, right. So we want to reject the the possibility that, that half of that difference was flipped. Right. Um, so how many ballots do? How much do we actually need to? Uh, how many places do we actually need to do these hand counts? Um, this, you know, this is a, this is a pretty easy calculation in probability. Uh, the answer is for 95% confidence level, we need to hand audit about 60 precincts. Uh, so the analysis is just this. Um, um, if we're looking for a 5% error, then we know that at least 5% of the precincts have some discrepancy in them. So every time we pick a precinct, we're throwing a dart at, 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 at a target. The dart has a 5% chance of hitting the bullseye. Throw 60 darts and you have more than 95% chance that at least one of them hits the bullseye. In a real election, a 60, hand counting 60 precincts costs eh, more or less about $100,000. That's way too much. If you're going to do this in every con congressional district in the US, that's $43.5 million. If you want to do it in state assembly races, races for mayor, races for dog catcher, and school board, and so on, uh, we just can't afford to do that. So an alternative approach is instead of picking whole precincts to audit, we're going to pick ballots at random, and we're going to audit those individual ballots. And the logic here is like this. Um, over here on the left, we have large granularity. Imagine that these are precincts. Uh, we have 100 marbles in, um, in the glass. And if we pick a 1% sample, that's one marble. We're probably not going to get a blue marble. That is, we're probably not going to get one of the corrupted precincts. On the right, on the other hand, we have 6,300 beads, of which 10% are blue. If we take a 1% sample of this, 63 beads, it's very likely that we'll get a blue one. So with a 1% sample is way more effective in finding a bad one if the granularity is small than if it's large. And so by switching to individual ballots, uh, we can get a huge improvement in efficiency, as it turns out. So if, for example, how large a sample do we need? Well, here uh, we want to reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of the ballots differ um, if, we're gonna, if we're going to audit ballots, we only need to hand, hand audit 60 ballots, because each ballot is a throw of a dart at the dartboard. 60 darts gives us a, uh, a high confidence of hitting the bullseye at least once. Cost is maybe $1,000. Way cheaper. But we don't do this. The reason we don't do this um, is that in order to do a ballot by ballot comparison, we need to be able to match up an electronic record with the corresponding paper record. That is, if we pick, let's say, the middle electronic record in this figure uh, to be recounted, we need to find the matching piece of paper that corresponds to the same voter's vote. And in order to do that, it turns out, we, um, we're going to end up compromising the secret ballot. The secret ballot being, of course, the rule that says that it has to be impossible to match up a vote with an individual voter. Um, uh, this is one of the basic requirements of fair elections. Uh, because, and, and, and it's a really important safeguard against coercion and vote buying. If you can't demonstrate to a third party how you voted, then they can't tell you that they'll break your legs if you don't vote a particular way or fire you or whatever, nor can they pay you to vote. Because you could say, yeah, yeah, I'll do what you want, and then go in the ballot box and just cast the vote the way you wanted, and they can't know, as long as we have a secret ballot. All right. So if we want to do the kind of matching of individual records, one way to do it is to put serial numbers on the individual ballots, like over here on the right, the paper ballots have serial numbers, and the electronic records also record the serial numbers, and uh, we can use these to match them up. But of course, in almost every polling place, um, it, uh, either a record is kept or a record could be kept of which voters showed up to vote in which order. So knowing that we're auditing uh, ballot number three, the third ballot cast on this voting machine, tells us.